Happy Wednesday to my wonderful sea turtles. As you see, I'm wearing our school shirt today just because I miss you guys so much. And we can still have some school pride even though that we're not going to school every day. So be remembering to wear maybe your house shirts and your riverbank shirts you have. Even if you're just staying at home, you know, walking around your neighborhood, show that riverbank sea turtle pride. Maybe even send me a picture and I can give you some house points for that. So we have been learning about area and perimeter. You guys have been doing awesome. I don't think we need to spend another day on it. So we are starting a new topic for today, okay? We are starting our polygon unit. And some of you may be saying, Miss Vizzola, what on earth is a polygon? I know I might have heard that before in third grade, but it kind of sounds like another planet or some kind of alien. Well, once I tell you, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, that's right. So a polygon is a shape. Okay, but in order for it to actually be a polygon, it has to be a closed shape. So it can't be open. All sides need to be touching. Okay, so polygons must be closed shapes and they can't have any curves. So I gave us some examples and non-examples here. These two shapes right here, we got a rectangle, we have a star. These are polygons because we see there are no openings. They're both closed, okay? And there are no curves. Now we go over here. A circle, circle that we all know and love, okay? It's a shape, but it's not a polygon because it is one big giant curve. And we know that polygons cannot be curved shapes, okay? So a circle, not a polygon. And we have this almost kind of a triangle, but we see right here up at the top, it is not closed. Those sides are not touching, which means that it cannot be a polygon, all right? So in order for it to be a polygon, it has to be a closed shape, all sides touching, and there are no curves. They have to be those straight lines, okay? Now, once we figure out that it's a polygon, we have to figure out what kind of polygon it is. So I listed, and again, this is going to be on Google Classroom. I'll take a picture of it so you guys have it, okay? Once you find out that it's a polygon, you need to figure out based on its sides and vertices, all right, and vertices means those corners of that shape, based on the sides and vertices, what kind of polygon is it? We have a triangle, all right, that's three sides, three vertices. A quadrilateral, four sides, four vertices. A pentagon, five sides, five vertices. I hope you guys noticed the pattern that I'm going in. A hexagon, six sides, six vertices. Heptagon, seven sides, seven vertices. Octagon, eight sides, eight vertices. Nonagon, nine sides, and nine vertices. And decagon, ten sides, ten vertices. Some of these you probably have heard more than others, like triangle, quadrilateral, hexagon, pentagon. And some you may have never heard of, like nonagon. Okay, that's something that isn't quite is normal as we see as our quadrilater quadrilaterals, hexagons, different shapes like that. So that will be on Google Classroom that when you are working on your Google Doc, you can go through and look at that to help you with your classifications. Now we are going to do some practice. So I have some shapes drawn on here and we need to figure out the shapes that are drawn. Are they polygons? First up, are they polygons? And once we figure out their polygons, we need to classify them. Are they triangles, hexagons, nonagons? We gotta figure it out, okay? Well, let's look at this one. Is this a polygon? So remember, in order for a shape to be a polygon, two things need to happen. One has to be a closed shape. All sides need to be touching. Well, looking at this, I don't see any openings. All sides seem to be touching, all right? So we got one check mark. Then I need to ask myself, are there any curves? Well, looking at this, this looks like an ice cream cone to me. I'm just kind of hungry drawing this. This has a giant curve up at the top. So because there's that curve, it is not a polygon. All right, and we can stop there and we don't have to classify it because triangles, hexagons, octagons, those go to names of polygons. It has to be a polygon before we give it the name of the shape. Since this isn't a polygon, it doesn't get a name. It's just not a polygon. It's 
Let's go down to this one. Looking, all sides seem to be touching. It is closed. I'm going to count my sides. I notice all sides are straight. I have no curves, so I'm good to go. It is a polygon, so let's count these sides. We have one side, two sides, three sides, four sides. Going back to the anchor chart that I made, I know when something has four sides, it is a quadrilateral. And I know all year we've been working on prefixes and suffixes. This prefix quad actually means four. So whenever you're reading, whether it be in a book, an instruction manual, something on your laptop or a tablet, if you see that it starts with the word quad or it has the word quad in it, chances are it has something to do with that number four, okay? Let's go down to this shape down here. Remember, I have to ask myself first, is it a polygon? Well. Polygon has to be a closed shape with no curves. I see it has all straight lines, but there's this huge opening right here. Those sides are not touching. So this is not a polygon. So then we can stop right there. We don't have to go any further because we can't give it a name if it's not a polygon. All right, now this weird looking shape here. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't make it not a polygon, okay? We have to ask ourselves, is it a closed shape? Absolutely, I see all sides are touching. Then I ask myself, are there any curved edges? Nope, all these little lines seem to be straight. It is a polygon, so now to figure out what to name it, I have to count all the sides. So I'll start up here. I got one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. So this is one of those names that is more irregular, that we haven't seen it very often. But to remind you, when it has nine sides, that is called a nonagon. All right, a nonagon, a polygon with nine sides. All right, let's go down to our next shape. It is closed, all sides are touching and all the lines are straight. There are no curves. So it is a polygon. I'm gonna go ahead and count my sides to figure out what name I need to give this polygon. One, two, three, four, five, six. So my polygon has six sides. So this polygon is a hexagon. And that's one that we've worked with before and most of you are saying, wow, that doesn't look like the normal hexagon that we see all the time when we work in class. It may not look like the normal hexagon, but that doesn't make it not a hexagon. All right, it has six sides, so that makes it a hexagon. Now, down to our very last shape. We need to figure out, is this a polygon? Well, it is a closed shape. I see no opening, so we're good there. But we have this thing that almost looks like a dome on top. This is a curve, and we know that polygons cannot have curves. So I can stop right there. It does not get a name, unfortunately. This is not a polygon. So most important thing today, I know it's going to take some practice naming all of the polygons. Um, because some of those names you haven't heard or seen before, but you need to make sure that you understand that not everything drawn is a polygon. Not every shape is a polygon. Think of our circle. We know circle's a shape, not a polygon, because it has curves. So remember, a polygon has to have all sides touching, needs to be a closed figure, and no curves. All those lines need to be straight. Okay? So, and that's going to be the end of our short little math lesson. If you want to pause this video to go ahead onto your Google Classroom document to, you know, fill out that independent practice, you can go ahead and pause it. But now I'm going to go ahead, pick up where we left off and number the stars. So remember last time I wanted you to focus on Peter. All right. We were focusing on those characters actions and Peter, we saw a lot of him in the last chapter. He was giving out 
all these clothes and blanket that were in that casket. We realized that the casket didn't have anybody in it. It was actually just all those blankets and clothes. And there was a woman who had a baby. And Peter had to make the tough decision to give this baby this certain kind of medication so it wouldn't cry. And for me, that shows that Peter is a very caring person because he's doing all this for people that he doesn't know. But it also shows that he's struggling and having to make these hard decisions. But it's almost easier for him to make these decisions because he knows deep down that he's helping them in the long run. It's not easy to give that small little sleeping baby that medicine to keep her sleeping, but he knows he has to do it in order for them to survive. So, now, Peter said, looking at his watch, I will lead the first group, you and you and you. He gestured to the old man, to the young people with their baby. Inga, he said, Anne Marie realized that it was the first name that she had heard Peter Nielsen call her mother, but it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was the first time that she had heard Peter Nielsen call her mother by her first name. Before, it had always been Mrs. Johansson. For in the old days, during the merriment and excitement of his engagement to Lee's, it had occasionally been Mama. Now it was Inga. It was as if he had moved beyond his own youth and had taken his place in the world of adults. Her mother nodded and waited for his instruction. You wait 20 minutes. And then bring the Rosens. Don't come any sooner. We must be separate. We must be separate on the path so there is less of a chance of being seen. Mrs. Johansson nodded again. Come directly back to the house after you have seen the Rosens safely to Henrik. Stay in the shadows and on the back path. You know that, of course. By the time you get the Rosens to the boat, Peter went on. I will be gone. As soon as I deliver my group, I must move on. There is other work to be done tonight. He turned to Anne Marie, so I will say goodbye to you for now. Anne Marie went to give went to him and gave him a hug. Well, will we see you again? she asked. I hope so, Peter said. Very soon. Don't grow much more. You're gonna get taller than I am, little long legs. Anne Marie smiled. But Peter's comment was no longer the light-hearted fun of the past. It was only a brief grasp at something that had gone. Peter kissed Mama wordlessly, then he wished the Rosens Godspeed, and he led the others through the door. Mama, Anne Marie, and the Rosens sat in silence. There was a slight commotion outside the door, and Mama went quickly to look out. In a moment, she was back. It's all right she said in response to their looks. The old man stumbled, but Peter helped him up. He didn't seem to be hurt. Maybe just his pride, she added, smiling a little bit. It was an odd word, pride. Anne-Marie looked at the Rosens, sitting there wearing the mishappen, ill-fitting clothes, holding ragged blankets folded in their arms, their faces drawn and tired. She remembered the earlier happier times. Mrs. Rosen, her hair neatly combed and covered, lighting the Sabbath candles, saying the ancient prayer. And Miss Rosen, sitting in the big chair in their living room, studying his thick books, correcting papers, adjusting his glasses, looking up now and then to complain good-naturedly about the lack of decent light. She remembered Ellen in the school play, moving confidently across the stage, her gestures sure, her voice clear. All of those things? Those sources of pride, the candlesticks, the books, the daydreams of theater, had been left behind in Copenhagen. They had nothing with them now. There was only the clothing of unknown people for warmth, the food from Henrik's farm for survival, and the dark path ahead through the woods to freedom. Anne Marie realized, though she had not really been told, that Uncle Henrik was going to take them in his boat across the sea to Sweden. Aha! So I know going back a few chapters when they first got to Uncle Henrik's house and the girls were standing on the water's edge looking over and Amory says to Ellen, look, across that way, there's Sweden. 
a lot of you made the prediction that, well, Sweden is still free at this time. It has not been taken over by the Nazis. So you're thinking that they're going to escape to Sweden so they don't have to be um, scared about the Nazis anymore. So seems like our prediction was correct. Anne realized, though, she had not really been told that Uncle Henrik was going to take them in his boat across the sea to Sweden. She knew how frightened Mrs. Rosen was of the sea. It's wit, it's depth, it's cold. She knew how frightened Ellen was of the soldiers, with their guns and their boots, who were certainly looking for them, and she knew how frightened they all must be for the future. But their shoulders were as straight as they had been in the past, in the classroom, on the stage, at the Sabbath table, so there were other sources, too, of pride, and they had not left everything behind after all. So that was a short little part of the chapter. And right before we left, before, before all of this um, coronavirus situation, we were really focusing on theme. And a lot of you, that is actually your reading goal, is to focus on characters' actions and how it affects the theme of the book that lesson that the author is trying to tell you. So based on what I just read, based on the character's actions, really focus on Ellen's family in particular, okay? Anne-Marie really highlighted some great aspects of Ellen's family before all of this World War II commotion happened to right now, how their actions have changed, how their lifestyle has changed. Based on that, Looking at Ellen's family, what could the theme be right now in this portion of the book? Because remember, theme can kind of, every chapter can have a different theme. It doesn't have to be the same in every chapter. So focus on Ellen's family based on how they've changed their actions in the part I just read. What could be the theme of this particular part of the book? All right. So I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. Make sure you're getting all that work done. I want to be able to be giving out 100s for everything. If you have any questions at all, make sure that you email me. And I can't wait to see you guys on a yet another episode on Thursday. Y'all have a great day.